Kerry Mugget and Andrea. Brilliant to be here this evening. I was at an event last night in um, Castle Wellen and it was um, it's part of Methodist Week. It's like a, like a week where the Methodist faith all get together and spend a whole week in Castle Wellen and talk about faith and things that are important to them. So they asked me to come along and be part of discussions last night. And one of the things they said from the start was we're going to find each political leader that takes a swipe at the other, we're going to find you all a favour. So I kept everybody behaving last night, so maybe we'll, we'll try that again tonight. Um, no, great to be here tonight and to be part of, of the conversation. And I actually think, when I was thinking about uh, what I would say tonight and, and the contribution that I'd want to make, the theme of tonight is very much about how do we accommodate, in the New Ireland, how do we accommodate people who, um, who are British, people who have a loyalist background, people who are unionist. And one of the questions actually that a guy came over to me last night whenever I'd come down off the stage, he'd said to me, you were talking there about a united Ireland, but like, what does that really mean for me as an individual, as a unionist, somebody who, who is British? And I thought that was just, that's the simple question which people are asking. And I suppose that's what, what tonight's about. How can, how can we do that collectively? But I had said to, to the guy, I said, you know, in my plan for the future and what I want to see in the future, it's very much about how do we shape it together? So how do I make sure that you know that your Britishness will be protected? So that's what I want to do tonight. And he, he found that like really reassuring, just something as simple as that. Your Britishness will be protected in the new Ireland that I envisage. So I just think it's, it can be simple things like that that can make a difference. But also it's about having the healthy debate. It's about having the conversation. It's about not being afraid to have the conversation. So, I mean, our vision for a United Ireland is very much an inclusive one, and it's an agreed Ireland. It's one in which all identities are respected and all rights are respected. And like my republicanism is very much rooted in um, many of the Presbyterian United Irish men and women who got together and sought to achieve Irish independence through the unity of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. And I mean, I very much acknowledge the Presbyterian voices who demanded government for the people, um, by the people and government with the people. So following in that progressive and rights-based tradition, I want to see a new and agreed Ireland and a united Ireland, but I want to see one that's defined by hope, one that everybody can be involved with, one where, which is prosperous, one that has opportunities for all citizens, irrespective of their age or their religion or their cultural identity, their political affiliation, ethnic origin or their sexuality. So in effect, what that means is I want to see an end to partition, um, the biggest destabilising event in the, in the history of Ireland. I want to see a new constitution, a new Bill of Rights, one that includes safeguarding the citizenship of British citizens, because that is what's important. And we have to make sure that there is recognition of the unionist identity. New symbols and emblems to reflect an inclusive Ireland. That's all a healthy conversation which, which we need to have. We need to see a quality of opportunity and outcome for citizens and looking after and caring for the most vulnerable in society. We need integrity in any system of government and public resources need to be allocated and shared on the basis of need. We need to have ensure that all citizens have the right to a home that they have a job, that they have access to education, universal health care, to a clean and safe environment. Because we know that partition has clearly failed. I mean, that's, that's a given. I think everybody can accept that partition has failed. But despite that, some people still argue that now is not the time to talk about Irish unity. But I would say to them that now, in fact, is the time to talk about Irish unity, never more so than, than now. Now is the time for us to be planning. Now is the time for us to be built in support for unity and to challenge the division and build an Ireland that's for each and every one of us. But as others have, have said, you know, I'm not, not naive or, or um, insensitive about unionist unease about um, Irish unity, but I see that as my role as a leader. I need to go out, I need to begin into rooms, I need to, needed to be in Castlewell last night talking to 300 people from the Methodist background to talk to them about their views, to listen to what they're saying, to hear what their concerns are. So I very much see that as the job of political leadership. We'll have to be talking about the merits of, of um, political, economic and social benefits of a new and agreed Ireland. I'm also very, very, very much committed to carrying on the excellent work of reconciliation which Martin McGuinness took forward over the last 10 years. Nobody worked harder than Martin McGuinness to reach out the hand of friendship. It wasn't just your politics. For Martin and for us, it was very much about we're in the phase of reconciliation. We need to start building bridges. We need to heal, heal the wounds and the hurt of the past. And if we're going to build for the future, then reconciliation is a must. And it's not something you just do you know, on, a, on a Friday or it's something you do you know, once a month. Reconciliation should be inbuilt to everything that we do day and daily. 
And I need to step outside my comfort zone as a political leader and go into rooms and make sure that I'm listening and I'm hearing what other people are saying and what their views are. Because if I just take it purely from a Republican nationalist point of view, sure, that's not going not gonna to get us anywhere. So I'm very much committed to building on the brilliant work which Martin did in terms of reconciliation because I, I absolutely 100% believe it's the only way we're going to shape the future together if we actually tackle head on the legacy issues which we need to, to deal with. When you're defining and, and agreeing and, and uh, shaping a new future, it has to be about how we're going to do that and make sure we protect the rights of all citizens. That's why I think it's so important that we have a Bill of Rights where we can say to unionist people, particularly those people that are concerned about the future and their Britishness, that we can say that in law it'll be enshrined that your rights will be protected, that your right as a citizen to be British and unionist will be protected. The Good Friday Agreement ensures the right of the people of the North to identify themselves, both as accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose, and accordingly confirm that their right to hold both British and Irish citizenship is accepted by both governments and would not be affected by any future change in the status of the North. So constitutional change can be achieved. We can do that. I, I believe very much so in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, we can achieve that without sacrificing anybody's identity or anybody's citizenship. But that's the kind of healthy debate that we need to have. Mark talked about examples of you know, people being fearful that land will be taken off them. and think, you know, We need to get the message out loud and clear that I'm not interested. I'm certainly, I believe most political leaders aren't interested in minorities or majorities. We need to have equality for everybody. So it's about how do we protect people's rights and what's important to, to individuals. The Good Friday Agreement provided the path, 50% plus one. If people vote for uh, unity, then that's the path which we are all very much committed to taking forward. But there is a responsibility on all of us who believe in unity to work together on the issue with the common objective of convincing the greatest possible number of people. I don't want 50% plus one, I want more. I want to be able to convince the greatest majority of people who, to vote for unity and that it's in their best interest. Because no one, absolutely no one, has anything to fear from the outcome of the referendum. We should have a mature, inclusive, healthy debate. So. I also think that now is the time for the Irish government and I welcome the commitment that has been made and the, and the change in tone over the recent times, but I very much think now is the time for the Irish government to become a persuader for Irish unity and to begin the preparations for, uh, for, for Irish unity. Now is the time for them to develop an all-party group to bring forward a green paper for unity and to develop plans for, for example, a, an Ireland investment plan and a prosperity plan for all parties and progressives who support unity to come together and stand together on the, the merits of the issue. Both um, previous speakers talked about Brexit and, and obviously that's now a major factor in terms of people thinking about the future and, and where they see themselves in, in the time ahead. And the referendum results swept away many of the previous political assumptions that um, about the constitutional, political and economic status quo of the North. But Brexit is now being forced upon us. Um, against the majority of the people here in the North who voted to remain within the European Union. What we have is a reckless Tory agenda, and they're, gonna, they're keeping on that track. I mean, Britain's in a heap. Theresa May, I don't believe, knows what she's doing from one day to the next, and she's absolutely got no interest in what is going on here in the North, and that's been borne out over the last uh, recent months. The DUP have also given a blank check. They've given a blank check to the Tories to do whatever they want in relation to Brexit, regardless of the negotiation, regardless of the outcome. Their deal, uh, their supply and confidence deal, has now given a blank cheque to the Tory government to do what they wish. So we have to make our voices heard and we need to be very strong and stand together where we do have common ground. And we do have common ground among the other parties on Brexit on relation to quite a number of the, of the areas. So we need to stand strong together in relation to that. We're also arguing the case for the North to be given special designated status within the EU, which will give us access to the single market, no borders, and special provision to allow the North to seamlessly resume full status of the EU in the aftermath of a successful Irish unity referendum. And it's clear that Brexit undermines the constitutional, the institutional and the political framework of the Good Friday Agreement. Yet it has also brought the debate on partition and the prospect of Irish unity into sharper focus. And I'm sure you're saying this yourself, no matter where you go now, people are talking about it. People are talking about Brexit, they're talking about the implications for the future, they're talking about, hold on, maybe could we be better off united? And they're actually asking questions, which I think is a very healthy thing. And I think that whenever 
I listen to some people comment in relation to Irish unity and that the debate's going to be very divisive and all the rest. It doesn't have to be. Of course it doesn't have to be. I think if we come at it with the right approach, if we stand firm together in terms of trying to shape the arguments to, to, to plan the future together, because I, th I think that's the message which unionism needs to hear. We need to plan the future together. It's not my view. I don't wish to impose anything on anybody. What I think we need to do is shape it together. And I think if we have the right approach to this, and I think I can agree in terms of some of what's been said already in relation to, you know, this is stuff that should have been happening for years, but it's just the nature of the society in which we live in, where it wasn't healthy, it wasn't, not, it wasn't healthy, it wasn't a comfortable conversation for people to have. But certainly I think the political landscape has very much changed and people are more inclined to have that conversation now. <coughs> I, and I've been told this quite, quite often actually, for a lot of unionist people it isn't an economic argument, it's the emotive argument, it's the emotional, it's their Britishness, it's, their, it's all of that. So I think we'll probably have to uh, cover all of that, make sure that we're, we're having the conversation around, around all of those things. But we certainly do need to develop the economic argument. We need to have that broader engagement right across all of civic society and mostly importantly with, with our young people. Now is the time for debate, now is the time for discussion. It's about broadening it out, it's about making sure people have their voices heard and that's going to be my focus, that's going to be the focus of, of Sinn Féin. Let's have that healthy debate and Gormila Mayogo.